We're going to pray together, and um, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to speak to my life, that you'd minister to my heart. I pray that your word would be revealed to me today in a way that I will understand it, that you'd give me spiritual insight into it so that I can speak it and do it and see it change my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about jump-starting your year. Guys, sorry, I still don't have a clock. Guys, what's happening with the clock? Sorry, can someone show me there? All right, I need the clock, guys. All right, it's flashing here. It's not coming on, so can we please fix it? All right, we're continuing with the series, Jumpstart Your Year. And I want to talk to you today about the blessing of fasting. Now, last week we started looking at Isaiah chapter 58, the whole chapter basically, and we started speaking about the purpose of fasting. And the key verse from last week was, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? And sometimes Christians are coming and they're fasting before God, and Christians are praying before God, and they come with this, this question, How come we pray? How come we fast? Some, some Christians ask, How come we tithe? And yet it seems like we haven't heard. Now, I want you to understand God always hears our prayers, but sometimes He hasn't heard because of the fact that um, we're fasting maybe in a way that God doesn't want us to fast. And I really just want to encourage you right now to, to look at what we've been speaking about last week. We spoke about the, the purpose of the fast is that we will change. The purpose for our fast is that we will change. Now, Often we pray that other people will change. But God doesn't want us to be praying prayers like that. He desires that we pray prayers that we will change. And that we will change how? By becoming more like Him. And the fast that He has chosen is a fast where we bring freedom to people. Isaiah 58 verse 6, Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and entire the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. And getting to the place where we ourselves are not controlled, where we ourselves have victory, where we ourselves overcome. Getting to that place. But also getting to the place where we're preaching freedom, the freedom of the gospel. The freedom of the gospel to people out there. It's a freedom that is spiritual. If people aren't free in the spiritual realm, they're not free at all. If you are not spiritually free, you are not free at all. <clears throat> the second thing we looked at was during the fast that we are giving to people. In other words, there's a physical manifestation of our giving. And the question there is, how generous are you? In Isaiah 58, 7, it says, Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see someone that is naked, you clothe them. And you don't turn away even from your own flesh. You don't turn away from your own family. And when you, when you see that people are in need, you give food to the hungry. You clothe the naked. And clothing the naked also includes those who've, who've messed up, whose reputations are being destroyed. Maybe because they've sinned. Or giving to the house of God. Your tithes, your offerings. At the end of the day, this is what God is looking for. But it's not just about your money. If all that it is is about your money, then at the end of the day, you're still going nowhere. Because God wants you to sow your life into people. And this is something that is emotional. It's giving at the level of your emotions. And Isaiah 58, 9 and 10 says, If you do away with the yoke of oppression with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. you know what I want you to realize? The average person is malicious in terms of how things affect other people because they want everything to benefit themselves. And then what happens is that we place a yoke of oppression on people around us because we point the finger at them. And my question to you today is how long are you pointing the pink finger at other people and 
how malicious is your talk? People are judgmental. People are critical. And something that has always marveled me is that when I look around and I listen to the world, what do I hear? I hear people saying, yes, the church is like that. And I want to tell you that you're believing a lie from the enemy because at the end of the day, yes, you may have people like that that are in the church, but that is not the gospel, first of all. But the other thing is, I've, I, my whole life, my personal experience has been this. It's 10 times worse out there than it is in the church. All right? It's much worse out there. Please do not come and tell me about the hypocrisy of the church. Don't set me off to start telling me, you about the hypocrisy of the world. Let me tell you in my lifetime, what has been the biggest or one of the biggest fights that I've seen? One of the biggest fights of the world has been for women's rights. Feminism, all of that stuff. And then what happened? Now we've got transgenderism. And now we've got men that are running as women. Breaking all the women's records, winning all the women's races because they identify as a woman. And I look at the world and say, what a bunch of hypocrites. All the fight that I heard of, of famous women sports people and all that sort of stuff, fighting for women's rights, fighting for equal pain, sport for women, and all sorts of things, and, you know, calling Christians misogynistic and all sorts of things. And now those same people, and, and this is how I like to talk about the world system and the world people, but it's a system. It's not the individual people. The world people are fruitcakes. How can you be such a hypocrite? I've never, ever in my entire existence seen hypocrisy to that level in the church. But you will be a hypocrite if you don't sow your life into people. You will be a hypocrite. If you're living for yourself, you will be a hypocrite because it's all about you. And it's all about what suits you in the moment and in the day. What are you giving up? This is a challenge against the core. And this is where the Bible becomes a bit difficult. Because when you really begin to read it, it challenges you and says, what are you giving up? You know, you're always complaining about what you don't give or what people haven't done for you. Or this, this person did to you or that person did to you. Other times you're complaining about where people haven't forgiven you. So you smashed up their life. You did this, you did that, you did the next thing. And now you're complaining that they didn't forgive you. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's only those who lay their lives down that are going to express, that are going to experience the fullness of the Lord. And now, taking that recap, the blessing of fasting. What are the results of fasting? You know, when, then. When this happens, then. And I want you to understand the reason why we're fasting is so that we can be fully and totally consecrated to Almighty God. Now I want to read to you for, from the, the rest of Isaiah 58, chapter 58, verse 8 to 14. I want to read it from the Good News Bible because it puts it in a way that's simple so that everyday people like us can understand it, everyday South Africans. And it says, after all those things that we read last week in verses 1 to 7, those points came from verses 1 to 7 of Isaiah 58. Starting at verse 8, it says, Then my favor, so when we've done that, then today. So tell the person next to you, say, when, say when last week, then this week. All right, so we're at the then now. So what it says is, then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun, and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. If you will put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt, and to every evil word, 
I will give I will give food to the hungry and satisfy those in need. Then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of the new. Now I want you to listen to what he says there. He says, if you will put an end to oppression. If, in other words, every bit of oppression that comes from you. If you will put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt. Every time you do anything to show contempt to anyone else. And to every evil wound. wound uh, sorry, every evil word. If you will give food to the hungry. If you will help those that are worse off than you. And satisfy those who are in need. Go meet the need of people out there that, are, that have a problem. If you will do that. Then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon. Verse 11 says this, And I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never runs dry. Your people will, re will rebuild what has long been in ruins. Building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who have rebuilt the walls, who restored the ruined houses. The Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. Listen to what he says. Then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. You know that when you serve the Lord, there's joy. And then he says, I will make you honored all over the world, and you will enjoy the land I gave to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now I want you to understand. You know, you look at this, he's talking about your ancestor Jacob. He's talking about the people of Israel. But we've been grafted into the promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and through what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. And therefore, those, these promises belong to us. Give the Lord the biggest shout of praise if you believe that. Amen. Come on, give the Lord the biggest shout, shout of praise. Amen. Come on, give Him a huge shout of praise. Amen. 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 When we fast God's way, 10 things I want to tell you today quickly. When we fast God's way, then number one, fasting leads to spiritual insight. Isaiah 58 verse 6 says, Then the light will break forth like the dawn. Your light will break forth like the dawn. In other words, you'll start seeing things through God's eyes. When you start seeing everything through God's eyes, then things begin to move in your life. It begins to move from why me to oh. Oh, okay, now I get it. Okay, now I understand. And when you move from why me, why me to oh. You know what happens? You move from having a victim mentality to having a victor mentality. We spoke about passive and active thinking last week. And I want to challenge you with that today. Do you have a victim mentality? Then fast. Even if you haven't been fasting, fast this week. Because if you have a victim mentality, the only way to get to a victor mentality is when you start seeing the world through the eyes of God. And you know when this most begins to happen? <clears throat> this most begins to happen when you minister to others. When you start doing the ministry of the Lord. When you start giving yourself out and laying yourself down for others. I want, you, I want to warn you that you make inferior decisions in life. Because you process wrong. And you process wrong because you won't minister to others. You're living life and it's all about you. You will never get as close to God as you want to, to get if it's all about you. And then it goes on and it says, if we fast this way, then fasting leads to healing. Isaiah 58 verse 8 says, and your healing will quickly appear. You're healed when you minister to others. When you minister to others, the healing, God, the healing power of God comes to you. 
You're touched with His presence. You're touched with His love. And if we're fasting this way, number three, then fasting leads to righteousness. Now in life, understand something. People are going to accuse you of things. And when people accuse you and you fast like this and you're fasting because you want to change, then here's the thing you need to realize. His righteousness will go before you. In Isaiah 58 verse 8 as well it says, Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear God. In other words, God has got your back. God is looking out for you. God is protecting you. And when His righteousness goes before us, understand that it's not our righteousness. So therefore, when people criticize our righteousness, they're not criticizing us. They're not criticizing our righteousness. They're criticizing God's righteousness. But guess what happens when God's righteousness goes before us? God's righteousness will cover the stupid things you do. Come on, tell the person next to you, say, Amen, hallelujah, I take that in Jesus' name. How many of us need the righteousness of God to cover the stupid things we do? Or are you one of those people that sits here all arrogant saying, oh no, I don't do anything stupid. Really? If you have a husband or a wife, let's sit down, let's speak to them for five minutes and ask you whether they agree with you that you don't do anything stupid. If you're not married, you're lucky, but we'll ask your parents. (laughs) For some of you, we just have to ask your brothers or sisters. And for some of you, we have to ask your children. Your children will tell us about the stupid things you do. But when the righteousness of God goes before me, I don't have to worry about what my children say. Because God will cover the stupid things I do. Come on, say amen, somebody. How many of you need that as much as me? Say amen, somebody. And then you will no longer need to be suspicious because you know, hey, listen, God's got this. Even though there are people that are out to get you, trust God. And when people have got, it, have got it in for you, remember it's not that people have got it in for you. They've actually got it in for themselves. They're in it for themselves. And they don't mind stepping on your face to get there. They're not trying to put you down f- because they don't like you. They're trying to put you down because they see your face as a stepping stone, you know, to sort of get up and then they're going to stand on your face to push themselves up. That's all that's going on. It's not that they hate you. It's just that they love themselves more than they love you. But if you're always fearful and you're always suspicious, you're going to make wrong decisions with people. And if we fast this way, then fasting leads to answered prayer. Isaiah 58 verse 9 says, Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and He will say, Here I am. God will come. He will say, Here I am. If you're core motive for fasting is that you change, God will answer your prayers because it becomes all about Him. 1 John 5 verse 14 and 15 says, and we are confident that He hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him. And notice what it says. We are confident that God hears us when we ask or whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him. But I don't like this gospel when it says anything that pleases him. What if what what pleases him doesn't please me? You know in America the biggest fear that people have, Christians, when they pray? That if they say, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done in my life. What is your will, Lord? Americans are scared that God's going to say, go to Africa. (laughs) At least that's one fear we don't have. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. We're in Africa. Tell, tell your neighbor, listen, say, we're in Africa. Maybe they don't know that. You know what I mean? If, if any of you don't know you're in Africa, there are, yeah, you know, maybe if you're watching in America, that's fine. But those of us that are, yeah, if you're in South Africa, it's Africa. South Africa. Amen? And then it says in verse 15 of 1 John 5, And since we know He hears us, when we make our requests, we also know that He will give us what we ask for. You can live a life where you know God will give you what you ask for. But how do you live a life where where God gives you what you ask for if you don't believe He's going to give you what you ask for? 
You see, that's part of what needs to change. That you believe that God wants to give you what you ask for, that God wants to bless you. So this kind of a fast leads to answered prayers. This kind of a fast also leads to influence. We're talking about fasting that leads to influence, number five. Isaiah 58 verse 10. Then your light will shine in the darkness and your, might will, and your night will become like the noonday. No matter how dark things may be, no matter how stupid you may think you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you may have lost, you will have influence. God wants to give you influence because... He needs to give someone good influence. Otherwise, who's going to right the wrongs? And number six, if we'll fast this way, then this kind of fasting leads to God's guidance. Where every day you get up, God is guiding you. Now, if you've been following the prayer meetings, we prayed and we spoke a long time about praying for the guidance of God. It comes up in the Lord's Prayer when you say, um, your will be done. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There we pray in the will of God, and that means we've got to pray the will of God in our lives. And then we, 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 we spoke this week about the part of the prayer which says, lead us not into, into temptation. God, order our steps. Order our steps, Lord. And so God in, will guide us according to Isaiah 58 verse 11. It says, the Lord will guide you always. Always means every day, Monday to Sunday. Always. If you haven't been part of the prayer meetings, I want to encourage you. They're on my Facebook page. They're also on the Active TV channel on YouTube and they're on the Active TV page on Facebook as well. Have a look there. Do it. Don't just look at it. Do it. Tell the person next to you, say, do it. Number seven, this kind of fasting leads to God's provision. And we're talking about prosperity in every facet of your life. Physically. In terms of your health. Emotionally. In Isaiah 58 verse 11 it says, He will satisfy your needs in a, listen to this, a sun-scorched land. No matter how bad things are going on in the world around you, He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. You will be like a well-watered garden. It means that God will provide. I want you to think of that concept now. We've had a lot of rain here in Gauteng. It's been pretty cold. And now they're talking about a heat wave in the Western Cape. And uh, oh, it's so bad. Climate change, that's what they're going to start saying. Next thing they're going to say, you need to be locked down because of climate change. Watch, mark my words. You may laugh today, but mark my words, it's cometh. Tell the person next to you, it cometh. Tell them it cometh to a climate near you. But just what it says, even if you're in the Western Cape, and I'm hearing about temperatures of 41 degrees. How many, how many of you know that's hot? 41 degrees Celsius. And there you're sweating and wilting under 41 degrees Celsius. And the land around you is sun scorched. It says you will be like a well-watered garden. That's how God will provide. What He does is He does three things. He satisfies your need in a sun scorched land. It doesn't matter how bad South Africa gets. It doesn't matter what happens to the land. It means you don't need to look at your bank account or your business's books. You put your faith in the Lord. You put your faith in the promises of Almighty God. Come on, amen. Give an amen, Active Church. Give an amen to the Lord your God. He will, he will provide in a sun-scorched land. Secondly, it means He supports your frame. He supports and He strengthens your frame. He strengthens your body. He strengthens your health. He gives you a strong body. He brings healing where you need it. And you will be like a well-watered garden, a spring whose waters never fail. Listen to that, a spring whose waters never fail. So you're in a sun-scorched land, but you are a spring whose waters never fail. You know, it doesn't matter how hot the sun gets if you're on a spring. 
you will always be green. Your provision will never run out. You will always have more than enough. You will have more than enough energy. You will have more than enough resources. But most of all, you know, you know what you'll have more than enough of? You'll have more than enough joy. The opposite of this is someone who's a leech. Someone who's sucking other people dry. And some of us know people like that. And trust, trust, I trust that none of us are people like that. And what happens is we're a leech and then we meet people. And we start speaking. And the moment we start speaking, we suck the life out of them. We suck everything out of them. And when they finish speaking to you, they're depressed because they've received your spirit. And you're depressed. And now you want to leave South Africa. Now you want to leave the world maybe. Now you want to commit suicide. And here's the challenge. You're depressed because it's all about you. It's all about you. Now you can be like that or you can be a fountain of life because people come into your presence and they're inspired and they believe that they can do it. This is what God will do when you become a well-watered spring. There will be life around you. No matter what you're going through, no matter how you're feeling, there will be life around you. And number eight, fasting leads to a godly heritage. Isaiah 58 verse 12 says, Those among you shall, be, shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And, and this is talking about your legacy. <clears throat> you will be known by your fruit. I want to tell you your legacy is about two things. It's about your children, your physical, biological children, and your disciples. The only way you get a legacy is through your children and through your disciples. There's no other way to get a legacy. How will you be remembered after you're gone? And you'll set a solid foundation for future generations. That's a promise that God is giving you right now. That your future generations will have a solid foundation to build on because of you. And you will set their feet on solid rock. Number nine, this kind of fast is fasting that leads to joy. Isaiah 58 verse 13 and 14a, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. In my notes, I, I underline that. Then you will find your joy in the Lord. Do you know that it's possible for you to find your joy in the Lord? How awesome is that? But what do you need to do to find your joy in the Lord? I will be in church on Sunday. I will be in cell this week. When training starts, Either if you haven't been through training, I will be in training. I will be in the life class. If you're in training, I will be faithful in training because I want to live a life that the Lord has set for me. If you're finished training, you'll be getting other people into training. This is what you do. It talks about Sunday, I will do the things the Lord's way. I will do the Lord's things the Lord's way. I will, I will be part of the gathering of the saints and I will serve. I will call the Sabbath a delight. I will call the Lord's Day honorable. That's what it says there. It's saying that we need to honor the Sabbath day. How do we honor the Sabbath day? By not going our own way. By not doing as we please. By not speaking idle words. We like to go our own way. We like to do our own thing. We like to do as we please. But this does not honor the Lord. If we don't honor the church of the living God, we don't honor God. When we start doing that, and we 
build our lives around honoring God. This is living with joy. It doesn't matter what phase of life you're in. It doesn't matter where you end up. When you live this way, whatever you're going through, you will have joy. Joy is a supernatural thing. You could be burying at a funeral one of the closest people you ever lived to, li- li- lived with. One of, the, one of the people that was the closest to your heart. You know what? Right there at the edge of that grave, you can have joy. Yeah, you won't have happiness. You won't. but you will have joy. Joy comes in your soul. Joy comes in your spirit. And it starts in the spirit and overflows to your soul. It affects your emotions. It makes you feel strong when you are weak. That's the way to live. And that's why number 10, fasting leads to blessing. Isaiah 58 verse 14b And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Notice Isaiah says the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What is this talking about? In every area we will conquer. This is the kind of fast that leads to conquering in every area of your life. And I want to encourage you to fast regularly this year, even when this fast is over. I don't just fast in this time. I fast regularly throughout the year. And fast because you want to change. Because when I change, everything changes. We go right back to what we spoke about last week. Passive thinking versus active thinking. Passive thinking, everything's happening to me. What about me? It's all about me. Poor me. If, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong for me. Murphy's Law. Active thinking says, no, 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 no. I start taking responsibility. I start taking responsibility for my prayer life. I start taking responsibility for my family life. I start taking responsibility for my finances. I start taking responsible, responsibility for my ministry. I, I start taking responsibility at work. I start taking responsibility for where South Africa is. I'm not just going to complain about it or blame the ANC. Because if the ANC loses power, do you know the country could be a lot worse? A lot of people today are blaming the ANC. But I want to warn you, if what replaces the ANC is not filled with God, the country will be much worse. Much worse. That's why sometimes I hear people, all the black people now, they tell me today, you know, the country was better under apartheid. Now, I'm not going to say whether that's true or not, but let me tell you this. What that would be an example of is that you have an evil regime. You think when you've replaced it, your problems are gone, except if something more evil comes in its place. You know that Hitler was seen as a liberator in Germany. I don't know if you're aware of it. Why do you think gigantic crowds would flock to see Hitler? And they'd have, if you, go and, if you go and listen to documentaries of people who were there and what it felt like to be in those crowds, it was a religious experience. To them, he was a liberator. Today, we know about six million Jews he killed. So whatever gets conquered <clears throat> needs to be replaced with the kingdom of God or it could be worse. When I change, everything changes. And I want you just really to think about this today. Because <clears throat> as you're sitting here, I want to speak to those of you that are saved. This is what Romans 8 verse 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you. So that's what he's saying. If the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. So is the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead living in you? If you know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, He is. But do you believe it? Do you believe it? Then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Do you live for the hope? That Jesus is coming back for his church? 
Do you live for the hope that goes beyond the grave? Do you live for the hope that says when people are crying at your funeral, you'll be with the Lord in glory? Do you live for the hope that the words of the Apostle Paul are true that say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Don't cry for me because I'm present with the Lord. Now I want to just take it a step further. Those of you that have accepted Jesus, do you live as if you believe this? But for some of us, I want you to realize believing or disbelieving this separates those that are destined for heaven and those that are not. And so if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, how do you come to the place where you get to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? What 45 steps do you need to go through in order to become saved? There's no 45 steps. Tell the person next to you, say, there's no 45 steps. It's very simple. And the reason why the gospel is the good news is because it's so simple. In fact, let me put it to you this way. It's so flipping simple. Romans 10, 8 and 9, but what does it say? The word is near you. So the Word is here. It's near you. In fact, you've been sitting in the service. The Word's been all around you. It's been coming into you through your ears. You've been maybe reading it on the screen, and, 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 and then it's coming to you through your eyes as well. The Word is near you. In your heart, so in your mouth and in your heart, there's two places that you have to conquer to be saved. Your mouth and your heart. So how do you conquer? That is the Word of faith which we preach. So there's a word of faith that has been preached to you that you conquer with your mouth and with your heart. Verse 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. In other words, if you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Jesus from now on is my king. I no longer live in a democracy. I live in the kingdom of heaven and my king is Jesus. Jesus gives me access to eternal life. But he's my king. I don't vote for the laws that he puts in place. He's my king, which means whatever he says is law. That's what it means to surrender your life to him. So if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, Lord means he owns you. Go to Old England. That term Lord, the Lord of the manor, is the owner of the ground, the owner of that property. So the Lord Jesus, He becomes your owner. He owns you. Your life no longer belongs to you. If you confess that Jesus now owns your life, that's what it's saying. And if you believe in your heart, so now the second part is your heart. So conquering your mouth and conquering your heart. What do you believe in your heart? That God has raised him from the dead. Now think about this. So it's easy to believe Jesus died on the cross. All his blood was poured out, every drop of his blood. That he went into the grave. That's easy to believe because we see that happen all the time. But just the, the part. Do you believe that God, after three days, raised him from the dead? Listen, if you believe that, you believe everything else. You'll believe every other inch, every other facet of the gospel. And if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So being saved means your mouth and your heart are conquered by the gospel. That's it. Now, it might feel hard. It feels very hard. But it's very simple. And I want to ask you right now, your eternal destiny is at stake. And, and I've spoken about that your mouth and your heart are conquered. And maybe you don't want to be conquered, but your eternal destiny is at stake. And so now you're arguing and you're fighting and you're saying, no, I'll do it later. I'll do it at home. I'll do it after church. But the Lord is saying, no. Now is the time. There's no time like now to be saved. There's no time like now to surrender your life. Because this place where we 
speaking this right now is an altar. And this altar sanctifies everything. And don't think that you're going to be more effective later. Don't think that on your own you're going to have a more effective time because this is the time that God has spoken to you. And when you respond, what you're saying is, Lord, this is the time. I want to commit to you at this very minute, at this very time, at this very instant. I want to submit my life completely to you now. I don't want to wait until I get home. I don't want to wait until later because I do not know if I will make it. I want to commit to you now, Lord. I want to commit to you now so that from this very moment I can live for you for eternity. I want to choose from this very moment right now in January 2022, I want to commit to you to live close to you from this day on so that whenever my death comes knocking, I'll be ready because I'll know that you are walking with me, close to me right now. And so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And if you're here at one of the other sites, in a moment I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if that call is for you. If that call is for you and you're looking from somewhere other than one of the sites, in other words, you're watching online somewhere, listening online to the live audio feed or if you're listening to the recording of the live audio feed or even if you're watching the sermon after effect, I want to encourage you to send an email right now to info at theactivechurch.org. Info at theactivechurch.org and, and this is what I want you to say in the email. I'm giving my life to Jesus for the first time or I'm recommitting my life to Jesus here today. Give us your contact detail. We'll contact you. But if you're sitting here and you know that the Lord has spoken to you and you either need to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you need to recommit your life to Jesus, then I'm going to ask you right now to raise your hand. Some hands have gone up. If there's anyone else, just raise your hands. Some more hands have gone up. I just feel I need to ask this again. There's some more hands in the front here to my left. Is there anyone else? I just sense that the Lord is saying there's someone that's sitting here and you're holding back. And you're saying, I'll do this when I'm ready. And the Lord's saying, you're ready now. It's an act of surrender. And in order to surrender, it takes an act of faith. It's trusting that God knows what to do with your life better than you. And so in terms of that, if you've been hesitating, just raise your hand right now. I just know that somewhere here or in one of the sites, there is someone like that. Just raise your hand right now. And we're going to pray with you. I want you all to put your right hand on your heart. And visualize Jesus. As you visualize, remember that He died on the cross for you. That's how much He loves you. I can't put into words how much He loves you, and I pray that right now, as I'm telling you this, that a flood of the love of God will just supernaturally enter your heart. You'll feel it right now. I just believe some people are being ministered to right now. They're feeling the love of God. And this Jesus that died for you over 2,000 years ago, the Bible says that this Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this Jesus who you see dying on the cross for you is the same Jesus today, and His work was done once and for all time, which means that work counts for today. That blood that He shed on the cross of Calvary just outside the city of Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago is so powerful that even today it's washing the sin of literally billions away. That work stands once and for all. Your faith in Him means 
that he has paid the price. The blood that he shed paid the price and that blood will wash our sins away. Just see yourself being clean now. We're going to pray, but you need to see it first. Because faith sees things in the spiritual realm. See yourself being cleansed right now as you surrender your mouth and your heart to God. Now repeat after me and pray. Say, Lord Jesus, today I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of everything that I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin and I accept your sacrifice. And I know it was the price that you paid for my redemption. And today, Lord, I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all my rebellion, all my sin, that you'd set me free from any sickness and from any pain. And Lord, I accept that my debt has been paid. I see my debt paid before you, Lord. I believe it, Lord. And there's therefore no outstanding balance because you paid everything for me with your blood on the cross of Calvary. I accept by faith that today I've been justified and that you see me as I've never sinned and that by your blood I'm sanctified and you've chosen me to serve you. I'm willing to serve you with all my heart. And so today I open the door of my heart and I invite you to come in as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and giving me eternal life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I need to get fired. I need to get fired. I need to go. This place is not safe for me. And I have the perfect plan. So here's the plan. He's going to walk past me and I'm going to flash him this. In case you're wondering, this is a pineapple. And if you know one thing about pineapples, is that they're used in pizzas. And he owns a chicken joint. So me flashing him this pineapple basically means I'm disregarding his chicken. I'm disregarding what he uses to feed his family. I'm disregarding his life, his entire life, his entire flow of income, which is life. So me flashing him this pineapple basically means I'm siding with the pizza joint down the street because they have a huge pizza sign next to a pineapple sign. So I'm going to flash him this and he will know and I will get fired and I will be set free. This cannot go wrong. This is it. You just walk behind me. It's time. I'm doing it. Doing it. Getting ready. It's about to go down. What are you wearing? What the hell was he wearing? Who comes to work like that? Ah! Is this how you come to work? Yeah. This is how I come. You know what? This do you want to know way. what I think? What do you think? What do you think?